who jumps out of perfectly good airplanes in the name of science, Mr. C. Happy Thursday to you, and you know what that means. The weekend is in sight. But before the weekend comes, out come your journals. Okay, so journals out. And you'll want to make sure that you have the information in your journal that I'm going to test you on. And I'm going to go over it one more time. Just rapidly read, pardon me, from Wednesday Homework Renweb. I list all the topics that I'm going to test you on. And I'm going to try to have enough time here at the end so I can go over that. I'm excited because my daughter Laura is going to share how you can expand your superpower. So God gives it to you and how can you develop it or expand it? She's going to explain. And there's one or two key takeaways I don't want you to miss. And I'm going to ask you for one of those major takeaways on the test. So as she's talking, what is the major thing or two that she never wants you to forget that will really be um, a life tip? I'll say it that way, a life tip that will really help you develop your superpower. More on that in a little bit. So your journals are coming out. Uh, where I'm going to first focus on the divine design section of your journal. So open to it. And then my divine design, we've already gone over two this week. Remember I said I'm going to try to do one a day. So I've already done all of Earth Just Right. You're going to have to do six to 10 of those on the test, ERS, JRs, or just rights. And then um, I showed you yesterday a picture and talked about DNA, which actually is my number one divine design. And then today, a cell, just an ordinary human cell. But it's not so ordinary. It's extraordinary because of all the little bitty parts and right now you're seeing a picture of both a plant cell and then a human cell and all of their specific parts that are in the, a specific place to do a specific function or job in a specific time. None of it's an accident. It's just so massively complex and planned. A human cell and then a plant cell that carries on photosynthesis. So complex there is no even little bitty chance either of these kinds of cells could have gradually developed or evolved no chance that is ludicrous, ridiculous, couldn't happen. And that's what Romans 1 says, just that it's obvious through what God has made, DNA, the things in space, Earth just writes, cells, it's obvious that there has to be a creator. And that's Paul's major point in Romans chapter one. All of that specificity everywhere you look in the universe. Specificity. You already know about the bodies in space, the right mass, the right gravity. They've got the right speed, the right distance from other things. All of that is specified, specific. So anyway, big deal. So there you have my third divine design, a cell. So cell it is. Make myself little notes for photos. So 
Now I've got a snow story for you and then I want to tell you um, a little bit about the snow totals and make a big deal about that because it's a big deal. It's a massive deal. So here is my snow story. Interesting, you probably already told this to, uh, to us. I don't think I did. I don't think I told you this um, already, but, it, but it's possible. The most amount of snow that I've ever seen with my own eyes, it was in, it would have been early January, right after the new year of 1968. My wife to be, Sharon Kincaid at the time, and I had been to a missions conference in the Chicago, Illinois area. We, came, we flew to Chicago, and then we took the train from Chicago back to Phoenix. Actually, we had to take it to Flagstaff. When we got into Flagstaff, I've never seen this much snow with my own eyes, and I've seen lots of snow. I've got my North Dakota hat on. I went to the University of North Dakota. In North Dakota, we had some blizzards where we had snow as high as a one-story building that had piled up in drifts. Same in South Dakota before I moved to North Dakota. But when I got into Flagstaff on that January day of 1968, the snow was perhaps piled up. It had piled up in drifts. I would say maybe 12 to 15 feet. It was so high as you were driving along the newly plowed out streets, you couldn't see anywhere over the top because the snow was piled up so high on each side of the road, you couldn't see over it. So sitting in a car, probably another six to eight feet of snow up above your car. So, and everywhere in Flagstaff. It had snowed so much. So anyway, it was uh, amazing. Now for our snow totals on this storm. This storm was way above average for amount of snow, amount of precipitation in the high country. I would say this would be like equal to two to two and a half footer, um, two, and a half, two to two and a half storms, which average about one foot. For instance, Flagstaff, depending on in and around Flagstaff, depending on how high, I'm not kidding, 20 to 40 inches of snow. That's anywhere from um, like a foot and a half all the way up to three and a half feet. So amazing. Now the reason for the variation in the snow depth, individuals measured and maybe weren't as accurate. But I did hear about 40 inches that had been measured uh, by people. It's called anecdotal evidence, but still lots of snow. The Payson area had anywhere from 22 to 28 inches. So again, anywhere from around two feet to two and a half feet. And then the Pine Top area, many of you go to these different places during the summer, the Pine Top Lakeside area, Sholo area, 15 to 25 inches. So anywhere from a foot and a half to two feet of snow. Prescott, some of you go to Prescott. Prescott had anywhere from 12 to 20 inches. So again, anywhere from a foot to um, almost uh, two feet. Probably in the mountains above Prescott, probably at least two feet of snow. So it was wonderful. Now remember I told you the really good news. It means in the White Mountains that snow will melt and it will run into the Salt River and into Roosevelt Lake and then the other lakes. Good news. But then all the snow in the Prescott and the Flagstaff and northwest of Flagstaff area, that's going to run off into the Verde River coming down from the north and that will fill up Bartlett Lake or put a lot more water back in Bartlett Lake. So thank you Lord for all of this. It um, was super duper. It was just amazing. 
Now, I want to tell you again the topics on the test, and then I want to review with an emphasis today on the metric system and on your superpowers. So I'm going to quickly go over this. Again, where is this located? Mr. C, where will I find this? Wednesday, homework on RenWeb. I have it all down. Here it is. Review all things metric system. So everything about the metric system, review it, including King Henry, which I'll go over in a minute. The boiling point temperature, 100 C to 12 Fahrenheit, both of those. And then the freezing point, 0 C and 32 Fahrenheit. Genesis 126, it's on your verse sheet. Then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. And then six, probably six to eight ways that you and I are made <clears throat> in little ways like God or different from animals. And then superpower stuff, which I'll go over in a minute, that God has blessed us with, including the smarts <clears throat> as part of your superpower. So, and then, um, let's see what else I have. Oh, there it is. Earth's just right, six to ten of those. What has improved weather forecasting, two things, weather satellites and weather radar. Why is weather forecasting still difficult to get right? Because there's too many variables to cause things to show up the way they did. For instance, this storm, the reason it nailed us here in Arizona and usually doesn't, it nailed us this time because the weather system out in the Pacific was just the right size. The jet stream was just right, so it aimed it right at us. And then, <clears throat> pardon me, it had just the right amount of condensation, just the right air temperature. That's why there was so much snow down low, close to the valley, which is unusual and pretty special, and more water in the lakes. So all of those specific things, and you, it's hard to predict all those things. Sometimes storms will start out like they're going to nail us, and then they go somewhere else because of one of those pesky variables that changes things. So another question, why does it rain or snow more at higher elevations? Because it's colder, therefore there's more condensation, therefore more precipitation. So anyway, there you have all of that. Now, metric system emphasis. I'm going to ask you for the what a standard unit is, a measurement word everyone knows and uses. What are the standard units in the metric system? First, this would be about a gram. A thousand of those would be a kilogram. A thousand grams. A kilogram. A teeny weeny little amount. One thousandth of a gram would be a milligram. So gram, kilogram, a thousand grams, milligram, a one thousandth part of a gram. Okay, now I just wanted to show you this. Christmas present we're still working on. Swiss chocolate. So good. This bar is equal to 100 grams. So 0.1 of a gram. What would that be? A decigram. So this is equal to a decigram, one-tenth of a gram. So how many of these would make one gram? I said it incorrectly. How many of these would make, and I gave you the wrong number here, my bad. This is actually a hectogram, right? 100 grams, a hectogram. So if this is one-tenth of a kilogram, how many of these would make a kilogram? Ten, right. This is 100 grams, hectogram. Ten of these would make a kilogram or a thousand grams. Okay, then a meter, of course. This is a meter. one meter, about three inches longer than a yard, 
A thousand of these would be a kilometer, a kilometer, kilometer, we, we pronounce it. So it's a bit more than half of a mile, a kilometer. Two kilometers about, about a mile. Not exactly, but about. So this is a meter, a thousand of them is a kilometer, one thousandth part, one teeny little bit, one thousandth of a meter is a millimeter, the little bitty bit, milla. Remember the beauty, you stick the prefixes, King Henry's, which I'll go over in a minute. So you stick those in front of meter, liter, or gram to change the number. A thousand of them, kilometer kilogram, kiloliter, thousand of them, one thousandth teeny weeny little part of a meter, liter, or gram, milli, a milli meter, a milligram, or a milliliter. A milliliter would be bloop, bloop, a few drops, okay? So how about if you had one hundredth part of a meter, what would that be? What's 0 0.01 of a meter, liter, or gram? Centi. So it'd be a centimeter, a centiliter, centigram. Okay. Uh, so the beauty of the metric system, what makes it such a great measurement system? Just a few things that you've got to know, meter, liter, or gram, and then king, kilo, so kilo, Henry, hecto, hecto, um, died deca, and then deci, and centi, and milli, and it changes the amount of a meter, liter, or gram. Just a few things. A few standard units, meter, liter, or gram. A few prefixes, just those six that I want you to know. Kilo, hecto, deca, deci, point one. Centi, 0 0.01, and then milli, 0.001, one thousand. So there's just a few things to learn, and it makes it really simple, so it's easy, and it's base 10, a base 10 system. You multiply or divide by 10. So check this out. So look what happens. As you go up from the base, it's times 10. So base is 1.0. Then 10 of those is a deca meter, liter, or gram times 10. Then hecto times 100 kilo, a thousand of them. Isn't that easy peasy? So you just add a zero going up from base 1.0, 10. Add a zero, 100. Add a zero, 1,000. Going the other way, it's 1.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. So 1 tenth, 1 hundredth, 1 thousandth. Okay? And that's it. So easy stuff. So anyway, I wanted you to make sure that you had all those. So tomorrow, Mr. C, are we going to have to know the King Henry? Yes. King Kilo 1000, Henry Hector 100, died Deca 10, by base 1, drinking Desi 0.1, chocolate Centi 0.01, milk milli point zero zero one okay and then the last thing I wanted to show you is your superpower so and I've got to write something else in here so when I ask you tomorrow what is your superpower and Laura's going to talk about how to develop it. There it is. 
Your superpower includes your gifts, your opportunities that God gives you, the Holy Spirit gives you. That's why I have the Holy Spirit there. Gifts, opportunities, talents, abilities, personality, your purpose. You have a great purpose for being alive. You're so not an accident. If you're if you're an evolutionist, you go, I'm just an accident. I'm not here for any real reason, and I'm just the result of billions of accidents over billions of years. It's such a lie. It's Satan's lie. You were designed by God, given your DNA, to make you the way you are physically and personality-wise. So your physical appearance would be part of this too, your whole package. So your GoTapi package, G-O-T-A-P-P-I. Gifts, opportunities, talents, abilities, personality, purpose, and then the indwelling Holy Spirit, the I part. The Holy Spirit, if you've asked Jesus into your life to forgive your sins, he came in, he'll never leave. And the Holy Spirit lives in you and the Spirit of God the Father, the Trinity. They will lead you and guide you all your life to your profession, to who you should marry, all the other decisions in between. They will guide you, they will lead you, they will protect you, and they will see you safely to heaven. We believers so have it made. So what's your superpower? The whole, the whole package. The real you. The unique you. That's your superpower. That includes all of that. Now I'll ask you, what does your superpower include on the test? All of those things. Gifts, opportunities, talents, abilities, personality, purpose, your smarts, all of your smarts, all of those things, okay? So, I was trying to get you ready um, for the test. I think I've done an okay job with that. I've gone over it and over it and over it. There's no reason you won't do well if you triple R, triple R, and then if you review, 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 you will remember, remember, remember. Now, you're going to watch Laura talk about how to develop your superpower. I'll ask you at least one question on what's the, what's the major thing that she said about developing your superpower or parts of your superpower. So you'll watch this, and then if there's any time left, I'm going to encourage Mr. Philip to let you review your journal for the last remaining minutes. I'll see you on Happy Aloha Friday. Adios. See you then. Aloha then. Hi, this is Your Magnificent Brain, Learning with Laura. And I wanted to um, kind of do part two of the Your Superpower um, lecture that we did several weeks ago. So during that lecture we talked about that you uniquely have abilities, talents, interests. All of those things are what make up you. The thoughts that you have, how your brain works. All of those things, your intelligences, if we want to call them that, those things make up you uniquely yourself. We are given things from when we are born that are ours. But over time, we also develop them. They grow. We can engage in time and energy in growing and leveling up those interests, those talents, those abilities. Even now, any talents, abilities, interests you have, some of them you're investing time in, some of them you're not. And I think it's important to realize that as much as we consider ourselves as 
being static and exactly as we are. We're actually constantly in motion. We're constantly in transformation. We're constantly in that fluid place of growing, changing, developing over time. So as we look at those different abilities, interests, areas where we naturally gravitate, but other areas where we might not have invested in as much, realizing that whatever area we can take our time, energy, actively developing them to level up, to gain more understanding, to gain higher levels of even expertise in a given field. Our abilities change over time. And I think there's something very powerful in realizing that you have some control over what you can do. By placing energy in a certain area, you'll get better. And that, I think, is so much better than a static model of thinking, well, I'm either good at something or I'm not, and there's no way to change that. So what we can do is we start to develop our interests, our skills, abilities in a variety of areas. We can really look at doing five different steps that can help really gain that momentum to keep that development happening over time. And again, the more time you do something, the better you'll get at it. So the first one is finding motivation. And it's not just the initial finding motivation. Um, when we see at the beginning of the year, many people set all of these goals for, I'm going to work towards running a marathon. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to do whatever it is. But the thing is, it's finding that motivation to start, to do the initial step forward. That's very important. But there's also the motivation to keep going, to every day remind yourself that there's a reason why I'm doing this, and I value it, so I'm going to keep doing it. And measuring and tracking your progress as you're going towards a goal is important. Goal setting is very important, just in general, um, because it keeps you moving towards something. But I would also say setting achievable goals that you can actually accomplish. Sometimes we set ones that are not something that we can actually accomplish, um, that will, we are destined to not be able to make happen because it's just too aggressive. It's not, it's going from not doing something to all of a sudden doing it all the time. Like, for instance, if we wanted to get better at basketball, um, because basketball is a, a skill that actually you do practice a lot of, if you go from not playing basketball and then all of a sudden going to trying to do, say, five sessions a week, it's a really hard change to go from that extreme, zero to five. Setting goals that actually are achievable, putting you know the goal of maybe doing one practice session a week, two practice sessions, and then upping those goals over time so that you have those wins where you've been able to meet your goals and you can continue to build on that and gain momentum over time. Learning from the experts. I, in my experience, even from a work standpoint, learning from anyone who had expertise that I did not have was so important because they were able to speak in a way that could link ideas together. Any, any area you're looking to go into, any area you're looking to explore and develop, there are resources everywhere of finding different experts who are talking about a craft, a field, a given area of interest. YouTube is a great place to find YouTube videos on certain you know, different subjects that you might be interested in. If you're interested in certain areas of science, chemistry, physics, if you're interested in learning how to play an instrument, if you're 
interested in learning how to sew, if you're interested in cooking, or if you're interested in volleyball, any of those areas of interest, and that's not even scratching the surface of the different things you could be interested in, gaining knowledge through listening to experts talk about what it is they do, why it is they do what they do, is really key in gaining your knowledge of something. But then after you've listened to experts, after you've gained that knowledge, it's important to put it into practice. So my next point is practice, practice, practice. Keep going, doing, taking the knowledge that you've gained and applying it. Actually doing actions over and over and over again that can get you better at something or reminding yourself, you know, studying and doing reminder sessions that keep the important um, the important things that you're hoping to learn, keep reminding you of them. And then lastly, take on challenges in that area of interest. Don't just sit back and do the things that feel really comfortable and within your level of understanding or level of knowledge the things that are like safe for you to do sometimes by pushing yourself and really challenging what it is you're capable of you can learn a lot more you can learn a lot quicker and by challenging what it is that's possible even by taking a risk that maybe it won't go a hundred percent perfect you then can fall back on it and say, but look, I did it. Even if it didn't come out exactly as I was hoping, I tried something, I did something, I made a thing, whatever it is. I tried, um, you know, auditioning for, for something. You tried, you stepped out, and then you can look back whether or not you were successful in that and say, look, I tried that, and I'm gonna keep working at it, keep developing in it, and try again. All of those things are to say, as I'm having these conversations with you, I'm sharing things that I wish I would have known a lot earlier, and especially that I would have known as I was going through school, so that I could identify how to use my time to really gain, in the, gain knowledge, expertise in the areas of interest to myself. You may not know exactly what directions you want to go in. You, you may not know exactly what interests you. But even sitting there and trying to start down that road of listening to yourself, figuring out where you want to start investing time in yourself, in your own development, it's a good time to be able to start having those thoughts, having those conversations with yourself of what it is you want to do not even just career-wise, but what it is you're interested in, what you want to do in your life, and recognizing when oh, you've experienced something that this, this thing, whatever it is, this is what I would like to develop, spend time in, really gain knowledge and understanding in over time, because it is fascinating and interesting and life-giving to me. So I hope this was helpful. I hope it's been a good week and um, I hope you have a good rest of your day and I will talk to you in another several weeks. Bye for now.